before. The podcast with Dan Bardell and Greg Evans. Hello, welcome back to 1874, the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Bardell, joined by the Athletics' Greg Evans for what I expect will be one of the more buoyant podcasts that we've done in 2024. Before we get into that, I mean, just I'm still absolutely buzzing, to be honest. Let's talk a little bit about NordVPN, who are our sponsor. You can grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to 1874.io slash NordVPN. And if you do that, you'll get a huge discount and you'll also get four months off you. Sorry, four months for free, which is an excellent deal. It's completely risk free as well because Nord offer a 30 day money back guarantee. Of course, as I try and read an advertising spiel, someone tries to ring me and it puts me off my flow completely. As I say, joined by the Athletics, Greg Evans. Greg, a result I didn't see coming. I didn't have much confidence going into the game away at Arsenal. Arsenal were on such a, a good run. It felt like the hardest team that we could have possibly been playing in some ways, especially away from home with the way Arsenal have been scoring goals and keeping clean sheets. But yesterday afternoon, Villa came in and really put in you know the kind of display we were seeing in, in 2023. Unai Emery with a, with a perfect game plan. The players executed the game plan to perfection. And it's one of those results that you just can't wipe the smile off your face because it was unexpected. And they just played so, so well. Yeah, there's been a couple of these results, hasn't there, over, over the years, you know, over the time that Emery's been in, in, um, in charge. I think back to the Tottenham game uh, in his first season, it was very similar to that, sort of soak it up in the first half and, yeah. um, and then have a little bit of a go in the second half. And it felt sort of around the 55th minute, 60th minute that Villa was starting to open themselves up a little bit. Um, they were they were knocking it around nicely. I thought that they were growing in confidence. Um, and 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 then look, you know, what, what obviously what happened at the end was just due to, you know, a, a bit of incredible execution of a tactical master of another tactical master uh, masterclass from from Emery. So yeah, I I think it's Villa's most important victory of the season, and I think with the context of everything. It's probably their most impressive as well, and I, I do. I genuinely think it's better than the than the Man City victory. I mean, that Man City game was absolutely brilliant. Probably one of my favourite games at Villa Park ever. I think you can bracket it as you know the Man City game was the best home performance under Emery, and this away one, you know, this was the best away performance under under Emery. Villa were they were just so so good. I mean, the end the ended I think with Arsenal fifty one percent possession and Villa forty nine percent. You know that is. The way Arsenal have been playing and dominating teams at home, I know they've had more possession than Villa there, but even that shows, you know, there was that control that Emery wants. And I, I just think in 2024, look, it hasn't been as as consistent. Villa haven't been as good as they were in, in 2023, but that was more like the Villa we saw in 2023 and also more like the Emery we saw in 2023 because it felt like he had a specific plan for that game. And it was yeah. executed to perfection. Do you, what did you make of the plan for that for this individual game? Yeah, I, was, I think it was similar to some of the other plans that they've had against some of the bigger teams um, in the division where they go and they try and keep it quite tight early on. Um, mix up their sort of build up plates, not necessarily slow and uh, and patient from the back. You know, as what we could see is Martinez was kicking it long at times to try and um to try and sort of put Arsenal on the back foot a little bit. Um and Villa were committing players forward. You know, th- there were times where there were sort of three, four, even five players, you know, over the halfway line. Um when Villa were building up, and that just, I think that just shocked Arsenal a little bit because um, they, they didn't quite get into the rhythm that they had um, that they have done in previous weeks. And I was watching the game with with a couple of friends of mine, and you know, early into the first half, they said this doesn't look like the Arsenal that have been smashing teams, you know, three, four, five, six. Um, you know, in, in more recent months, and I said, "If yeah, hold on a minute, they're, they're, this is an Arsenal team that are playing fourth or fifth in the, in the division. This isn't an easy game for them." And as the game, you know, matured, it just showed how good Villa are as a side. Um, and one little thing that I that I picked up, I mean, it's pretty incredible, really. If you think back to the the summer when me and you were talking before the season started, we said that Villa's biggest challenge was going to be handling Europa Conference League games 
and the Premier League games. Well, since since Villa have qualified for the Europa Conference League, they've played 10 games and they've only lost one game directly after a Europa Conference League game. Spurs and that, game. And that's the Spurs game. So for a team that are very new to Europe, you know, haven't been in Europe for what, 14, 15 years, however many years it was, I lost track. But um, for, for, for a new team who are trying to get used to um, mixing those demands, that's that's as impressive almost as their league position now because, you know, look at West Ham last year. Yeah, they went and won the Conference League, but some of their Premier League uh, results dipped after, you know, dramatically at, at times. So for Villa to still keep churning those results out in the Premier League directly after Europa Conference League games is, is mightily impressive for me. Um, and we almost said, didn't we, around uh, the sort of Christmas period where it died down a little, uh, sorry, after New Year where it died down a little bit. We were, we were almost joking that Villa need the Thursday, Sunday routine to get back yeah. into their flow. And, um, you know, it feels that way. Okay, the Lille game that we, that we can maybe discuss at some point, you know, during the podcast, I actually thought Lille were the better team and I, and I was, was a bit concerned about Villa's performance there. And 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 I, I am a little bit going into the, the second leg as well. Same. But but, um, but look, you know, the, the, the way they uh, the way they got the most important result um, at the weekend was 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 really impressive. You referenced this being more impressive than the Manchester City game. I think maybe the one thing that does make it more impressive for me is Villa not having their first choice central midfield against one of you know the best teams in the division. No Louise, no Kamara, who we obviously haven't had for, for a few months now. I was concerned how Villa would Villa would line up. I thought it would be difficult against Arsenal the way they pop the ball around their, their movement, especially the way like. Erdegaard comes in. I was actually quite encouraged by the fact they played Havertz in central midfield because they went away from what's been working mm -hmm. for them. And I think that makes them more open in the middle of the park, which I think actually ended up suiting Villa. And I did reference that in, in, in a tweet before the game that, that might play into our hands a, a little bit. But to win that game without those two in central midfield, obviously without the players that we've known have been out for the, the entirety of the season, no Matty Cash as well. And the players Villa had missing and to go there and win 2-0. You know, this isn't, you're not playing Arsenal when they're in the midst of a bad run either. They're in their best run of the season, maybe even their best, most efficient run under Arteta. All those things added up just makes it so, so impressive. They hadn't lost in 2024. You know, so have they even lost at home in the league this season. Have they, have I think they'd they lost to West Ham, yeah. So they lost once, but um, okay. but they they hadn't lost in twenty twenty four. So you know, four month, four and a half months oh, into wow. the calendar year, it's it's so so impressive. And you know, I watched the Arsenal Bayern Munich game, which was a bit frustrating on that day because you know we, I put something out on my, my Twitter page. You know, with all the ridiculous tea, uh, tea off times, <laughs> talking about golf. There he is. He's, he's, he can't <laughs> with get away the, from it. With all the ridiculous. Uh, kickoff times now, you know, that we see over multiple days in the week and weekends. Um, isn't it still crazy how you can't watch two quarter final Champions I'm, League games? I'm seething with that. It is horrific. So me. it's like I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, Real Madrid versus Man City, that's going to be a good game to watch, regardless of how the result ends up. Um, and Arsenal by Munich. And I, I wanted to watch. I wanted to watch both of them, like like mm. I do in the Europa League. I can watch a game at half five and then a game at eight o'clock. Great, um, but anyway, I chose to watch Arsenal Bayern Munich, and you know, I was thinking the way that sort of Bayern Munich set up, they were very, um, you know, sit back or let Arsenal come at us and try and get them on the counter attack, and I think that's kind of what Villa wanted to do in the first half um, of the game, and did it quite well. Uh, you know, very, very unlucky not to not to open the scoring through through Watkins, obviously with that shot that hit the post, and then a couple of other opportunities. By the way, did you hear what Arteta said after the game about? I uh, read uh, it. I mean, what is what on earth is he on about? He, There's only he one said, team that were unlucky in terms of chances missed, in my opinion, and they weren't wearing not red or white. But his his direct quote was, "We played the best. We we put in the best performance that." Uh, of the season in the first half, and we should have been three, four, or five ahead. No. Now, now, can, I can't even, I can't even remember four chances, clear the cut Martinez chances. Martinez one that, they that had. you say with his foot straight after Villa had hit the post is the only one that's yeah, that, to mind. They had a couple of across though. the goal and things like that. But, but they didn't have, they didn't have three or four clear cut chances, no. let alone five. And he's saying they should have been five nil up. So the only, the only, the only real clear cut opportunity I can remember is the, you know, the Martinez one that from Drossard, brilliant, brilliant save. Uh, right. 
And, you know, Dor- as you say, Dan, straight after the, the Watkins chance, that was a real important moment in the game um, and just shows how important, you know, Emmy Martinez is. I, I know I say this every every week, but he does make a world-class save so often and, um, you know, and, and, and pretty much almost in every game. And when you think what he's done this week, you know, the, the wonder saves against Lille, that brilliant save against Arsenal, you know, how different might it have been if if Villa didn't have Emmy Martinez? And I just go back to the start of the season, sorry, not the start of the season, sort of three months into the season, where I said, Emmy Martinez, Ollie Watkins and John McGinn, those are, th- those are the three most important Villa players. And I think when those three players are in the Villa team, they've always got a chance. So, Regardless of not having Louise and Kamara, which, yeah, are a loss, I think Villa need those three in the team more than anyone. He is just, he is the best keeper out there, in, yeah. in my opinion. I say that with, I mean, people say, I can't really say, I say it with no bias whatsoever because I am a Villa fan, but I don't see, when I, know I watch a lot of football, I don't see a more complete goalkeeper because I think how his distribution is now goes completely under the radar. It doesn't get touched. You know, the goalkeeper's good with his feet, but Allison and Edison, he gets spoke about like he's like they're, these, like they're so different to every other goalkeeper. But I think he's a better shot stopper than them. And I don't think his distribution is far off. He's one-on-ones this season. He's been a beast at, at one-on-ones. Yeah. I think that's something he's added to his game this season. I don't know whether he's changed his technique slightly or the, the time he springs, the time they you know how he closes angles. But something has changed with one-on-ones this season. He was always very good anyway, but I think he's exceptional this season and you, you're right you did say that earlier on in the season and since you said it I have noticed that every game he makes a makes an unbelievable save that kind of changes the game state or keeps the game mm. in the in the state that it's in which it, which is really really important I will say actually that didn't happen against Brentford because every shot <laughs> target went in in that in that game didn't it but yeah he um, unbelievable goalkeeper it's great for him as well he spoke quite highly of, of Arsenal after the game, Emmy Martinez. When I did the preview with Jacob, I didn't actually even talk about the fact of Emery going back to Arsenal. <laughs> he will probably, he would say, it's, you know, prepared the same as I, as I did any any game, had a plan like I would for any game. But deep, deep down in, in Unai Emery, he will be delighted to have gone there and just, you know, not just won. But been the better team because I think Villa Villa were under the not under the cosh, that's not the right phrase. Villa were under pressure a little bit in the first half. I would say Arsenal were the better team in the first half, albeit Villa had the best chance. But Villa always carried a threat on the break in that first half. But in the second half, Villa were, you know, it was there's no debate. Villa were comfortably the best team. You know, Tillemans hit the woodwork yeah. as well just, just before we scored. You know, the control that Villa had in the game. It was back to the way of pass being perfect, breaking the lines, you know, playing the pass at the, at the, right, at the right time, players popping up into, into space, really clever off the ball movement. You know, Villa soaked up pressure, but also just looked really good going, going forwards again. But deep, deep down, Unai Emery, He'll be proud that he's done that against Arsenal, and it will really, really mean a lot to him because of the way he was treated yeah. when he was there. Yeah, the, the, there'd have been so much, you know, so much emotion that he that he sort of keeps to himself and doesn't let it out. But within his inner circle, it, he would have celebrated like this, like you know, no other, no other victory. It, it was huge. That's his biggest win at Villa. Uh, I think the there are there's had quite a few, <laughs> you know. Beating Pep Guardiola for the first time was something that he desperately wanted to do. Um, you know, really, really admires Pep for for you know, like many other managers, for the um, for the career that he's had, the way that he's changed football. Um, you know, and has studied him at, in depth at times. So was really was really motivated to to beat a Pep Guardiola side at some point because he just hadn't managed that um, during his time as manager at Valencia and um, Sevilla. And I think PSG maybe might have... No, no, no. But um, yeah, so, you know, he was desperate to, des- desperate, to beat, desperate to beat Guardiola. So that would have been a really big one for him. I think the Arsenal home win was really big. Um, you know, there were quite a few towards the back end of last season. He, he, he was so proud of the Newcastle performance, you know, beating Newcastle 3 0 last year when, um, you know, that felt like one of the most complete performances of, of a Villa team for some time. Um, but look, you know, going back to the Emirates, a player to succeed as a manager and felt that he was, you know, short change there. He, 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 he felt that he, he wasn't given enough, um, authority there. You know, he wasn't. If, 
if if he if he had had the freedom that Mikel Arteta has had and had the support and the belief from those within Arsenal that he could go on and, and take the club forward, I think he would have done just as well as as, as Arteta is doing now. Um, you know, if not better. I think what you're seeing at Villa is because he's had so you know he's got the keys to the castle. He he can choose who he wants to bring into the football club and. Pretty much everybody other than Mateo, Mateo Alemani, the um, sporting director that didn't go through, um, you know, he decided to stay at Barcelona at that point when when Villa tried to hire him. Other than him, you know, Emery's got pretty much everybody that he that he that he's wanted to to bring into the club. You know, Monchi wasn't a bad second choice, was it? Somebody he knew very well, and um, you know, worked so well with at uh, um, Sevilla. Alberto Benito, who is um, you know used to be his chief scout at. Um, and and somebody he'd known since he was a player, you know, m- many other staff members as well. Damia Vidagani, who is his personal assistant, a lot of it, a lot of it at Arsenal was that he just didn't get the backing that he that he needed. Um, so all that would have been playing over going into the home leg, uh, the home the home fixture, which Villa won so convincingly. But going back to Arsenal and the Emirates yesterday, you know, it would have brought back memories of his time there. So to go there and get the job done. Um, you know, very, very proud. And you, you know when he's really happy because he posts on Instagram and he did yeah, it tonight. That's true, <laughs> that's true. yeah. Uh, we'll have plenty more to talk about for, from this game. An incredible day for, for Aston Villa Football Club. But before we carry on, let's hear a little bit more from NordVPN. 1874 is proudly sponsored by NordVPN, so when they and you can't watch it, we want to help you. NordVPN is a secure and private service which works on pretty much any device, including your laptop, mobile, and television. So if you want to watch some live content, it allows you to appear like you're in another country. And whilst you're connected, no one else can find out what you're doing, including your internet service provider. Beyond this, the service also has threat protection baked in to protect you from intrusive website ads and malware, which is pretty handy for you. As part of NordVPN support performance for free, this also includes Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. All you've got to do is go to 1874.io slash NordVPN and sign up. All the details are also in the description. As always, we're very grateful to anyone that signs up. We know that money is tight, but if you think NordVPN will help you out, it will also help keep the channel running and help us too. I think the team selection for this one was was fascinating, Greg. If I'd have had to have guessed the team that Unai Emery was going to pick, I don't think I would have guessed that 11. You know, Diaby came back into, into the team. Zaniola, who probably has been pushing for a start in, in a lot of ways, came in and, uh, and played as well. Obviously, he went with Tillemans. And McGinn in, in the centre. Rogers, it felt, played more as a, a support striker and Diaby was playing in Bale's position on the right. I just want to go through a, a few players in the team and, and how they played in that game. And we'll, we'll start with Zaniola. I thought he was brilliant. Held the ball up when he needed to, showed, showed his strength, moved the ball at the, at the right times, played a couple of key passes, but worked very, very hard as well. Do you think something's clicked? With Zaniola now, Emery, Emery referenced after the game that you know over the last two months, it's like there has been a, a flick of a switch inside him, and he, it still felt like he was reluctant to start him. But then he, you know, he played. He started against Man City as well, didn't he? And then started today in what was a, a stronger Villa lineup, and held his own and was important in that victory. Yeah, I liked him in the first half against Man City as well. I thought he was, you know, very progressive with the way he was moving forward. He picked out a couple of nice passes. Um, looked quite confident, and and he's quite an aggressive player, isn't he? He didn't. I didn't. Unique. I didn't expect him to be sort of quite quite up for it as as, as he is. So you know, I like that. I think that's what fans tend to you know buy into if if players aren't good enough, but they try really hard. Um, you know, they like that, don't they? And John McGinn had that little moment, didn't he, in the second half where he sort of held off a couple of players and then won a corner from it. Um, you know, th- those are the moments that sort of really get the fans going. And Z- felt Zaniola was the same because he won a couple of corners as well in the second half. And um, we can get onto the set pieces later where you know, Villa have scored again from a set piece and are now, you know, by far the the the, the highest scoring um um, attacking team in Europe from set pieces. We, you know, we, we'll get onto that later. But, 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 yeah, he he, he did his job. You know, he, he tracked back when he needed to. Um, he sort of limited the threat of of Arsenal's um, attacking players on his side. 
And I thought he put in a decent shift. Yeah, there were look, there are times where he gives the ball away and he can be, become a bit, he, he can get a bit frustrating. But if you look throughout his career, you know when he was at, um, you know, playing in Italy and, and, and coming through, and even at, at um, over in Turkey with uh, with Galatasaray, wasn't it? Um, yeah. You know, he had he he was always a player that sort of had a little bit of freedom and was quite not a luxury player, but somebody who was allowed to go and do the attacking stuff and not have to worry too much defensively. Under Unai, under Unai Emery, that is not the case. You know, you have to you have to do everything. And it's taken him a little bit of time, but I think what we're starting to see now is a player um, used to his surroundings, used to his teammates, used to the pattern of play, used to the demands. Um, and we're coming close towards the end of the season, aren't we? And, you know, he might want a permanent move, so he might be a little bit more motivated to play right now. Yeah, got 90 minutes under his belt as well. That must be one of the first times he's played 90 minutes for, yeah, it's gotta be, hasn't it? for, for Villa this season. Didn't get a yellow card either, which, you know, absolutely, <laughs> in recent weeks, it's felt like he's going to get booked every time he, he sets foot on the pitch. But I, th- I thought he was brilliant, you know, in a, up against a really, really good team. It's almost like... You know, I feel like he's one of the players that you play against better opposition and he'll play better, if that makes sense. He, he looked really up for it throughout. And another player I wanted to pick out is, is, is Tillemans. Someone tweeted me yesterday saying that they listened back to an old Villa View podcast. And this is years and years ago, probably when, when Gerard f- first came in. I was talking about central midfielders and I was raving about Tillemans. And in a dream world, he's the kind of player I'd love to see at, at Villa. He's been brilliant. In recent weeks, getting a lot of assists that are kind of going under mm. the radar as well. His precision on his passing, his passing's brilliant. I thought he was absolutely exceptional in the game. I thought could be hard for him, but I feel as the season's gone on, he's actually become more mobile and and, and fitter, and he's just a, a lovely, lovely footballer. I think he's always been a footballer with a real high footballing IQ. Absolutely brilliant yesterday. Yeah, and I mean, you, you know, you look back to a couple of years ago, the season before Leicester got relegated, and, and you know, Liverpool and Arsenal were looking at him. There were other clubs, you know, really high-level clubs looking at him. Um, you know, and Leicester had an, an, a wonderful, wonderful midfielder in 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 their team at that point. Um, you know, obviously scored the winning goal in the FA Cup final, didn't he? So he bringing him in, bringing him in on a free transfer, I think was a not a shrewd signing because Villa paid a very, very big amount of money um, in terms of his overall package to, to get him through the door. Um, and no other club was prepared to to pay that. But what we're seeing now again is, a, is yeah, I think you're right. He looks a bit fitter, doesn't he? And yeah. there was there was never any doubt of his um, technical ability and, and his passing qualities. Um, think back to that Fulham win at Fulham. Lovely assist for, for Watkins. That was the one that really stands out in my mind. And very, very unlucky not to score yesterday. Um, you know, hitting the, the bar on the post. I can't believe that didn't go in. That That's a typical Tielemans oh, goal, strike. isn't it? What that's a Tielemans goal, isn't it? That's the one you, when, when he signed for Villa, that's the one you're thinking... You're going to get a couple of those goals this season. We're going to see. Fair, we have had a couple of good goals from him. Yeah, we've had a few. Villa have had a few already, but um, those are the ones that you, you know you just you just expecting to to sort of go in. But yeah, he's worked well. You know, very very um, sort of tactically intelligent. You know, your take on um, multiple instructions. Um, you know, very important around set pieces now. You know, works hard with Austin McPhee. Some, I think set pieces are just. They can be a bit boring for players, you know, because Rockin said that, didn't he, after Lille? It, did he? Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's a it's a uh, a widespread opinion. You know, it's something that it doesn't really. I must be really yeah. boring because I actually find it really interesting. <laughs> I think it's because we don't play, isn't it? You know, and then on the yeah, I'm not doing the drills. A, I'm it's, a... it's a new sort. Of, it's a, it, it's an emerging sort of area area, isn't it? You know, five six years ago we didn't have set piece coaches. Now all of the forward thinking and, and big clubs have them, um, and Villa are, are performing you know exceptionally well. To to be the best in Europe is really really hard. So fair play to the you know the players for executing the plan, Austin McPhee and his team, and and Unai Emery for 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 leading it all. Um, but yeah, look, you know, Tielemans has, has become a part of that, you know, that culture, that set-piece culture. Um, 
you know, willing to learn, willing to work hard and, and sort of, you know, get, get really into the nuts and bolts of things. Um, and what we're seeing at Villa now is just, uh, you know, players that are just increasing in value. Okay, Telemans is going to be no real resale value on him. I mean, he costs more than zero pounds now, Greg, so you could say he's got <laughs> you got to put value. the you got to put the package together, oh, haven't you, when he signs on a big deal on, a, you know, one of the highest paid players in the in the division, uh, sorry, in the, in the um, uh, team. You know, it's, look, it's an expensive deal, but um, worth it, isn't it? You know, because, yeah. you know, Villa have needed him. My type of footballer, I love a central midfield player that can, can just, his passes are just so, so precise. When he plays a through ball and he gets it right, it's spot on, like for, like for the Watkins goal yesterday, just mm. looped it over, over the top. Just, it's a really, really nice pass. And he's done that a few times recently. He's definitely played people through a, a lot in recent games as well. A player that's just grown as, as the season's gone on and he's a really important vital member of the squad. Another one that plays in, in a couple of different positions as well for the, for, for the mm. team, which is becoming increasingly important at Villa and in, in modern football as, as well. Another player I wanted to touch on is Diego Carlos, man of the match against Arsenal twice this season, so the Sky man of the match yesterday. Questions have probably been asked of him a, a little bit. I still don't think we've seen the best of Diego Carlos, but there's no doubt that you know that horrendous injury will have will have played a part and would have probably slowed him down a little bit as well. But again, when the big games come round, Diego Carlos is in the team and he performed really, really well yesterday. My um, niece, it was her birthday last week, and she got got a Villa kit for her birthday, and I, I'm quite a sad man, really. And I, I like to see who people choose to get on the, the back of their shirt. And she chose Diego Carlos. Oh, really? Like, Can't I can't imagine like, he's too popular. No, I, was like, I was like, I don't think I've ever seen a Diego <laughs> Carlos shirt at, at Villa Park. I was like, why did you why did you choose that? And she was just like, I just think he's good. I like, I like, I, 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 I like him. He's she's, quite good. Yeah. yeah, she's eight years old, and I kind of questioned it uh, a little bit, but it turns out, actually, that the... Eight-year-old Gracie knows more about football than me because she was <laughs> she was right. He was he was brilliant against Arsenal at the weekend, wasn't he? Big big guy, isn't he? You know, very you know, the guy incredible is physique, like a, an incredible. Adonis, isn't he? Really, really Incred- incredible Greek physique. God. To sort of, to sort of maintain that physique as a as a footballer, you know, it must be must be so difficult with the um, you know the amount of cardio that you have to do and. Um, you know, it's it's yeah, incre- it's incredible, it's incredible. Not cardio, Greg, that's weight. No, I mean, with with, with the yeah, amount of cardio that you have to do strong, to maintain a body strong, like that, it, you know, it's in, it's incredible because you know you think you'd be burning so much of the of the muscle down, but um, yeah, look, very very impressive yesterday. Uh, the the real standout moment for me was early in the game, and you know, it was before it was before he'd almost done anything in the game. It was Torres had sort of misplaced a pass. I think he just took a little bit too long around the halfway. Um, around the halfway line and Carlos just somehow caught up with the, I can't remember who the striker was, he somehow sort of covered him and caught up with the striker and I thought, wow, I didn't realise you were that quick, um, you know, but like absolute like lightning. Got the burners on. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then not very, you know, very impressive throughout there, sort of kept, kept the forward line quite quiet. Another thing that was really impressive from Villa, um, First contacts from from set pieces. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Complete opposite I, of, of the they won, they won every single one. One hundred percent, a hundred percent first contacts. Why that, does that I mean, change, that, Greg? Because Villa haven't looked like that in recent weeks defensively. I've not felt comfortable at all. But then suddenly yesterday against probably you know one of the best teams at set pieces in in Europe. You know, got some big guys coming up for set pieces. Mm-hmm. Every Arsenal player just looks like a, a specimen. They've got a lot of six foot plus players. I was worried about set pieces and crosses mm-hmm. going into that game. But we dealt with it with ease. But then that's not been how we've been in in, in recent weeks. So why? Why does? How does that change against the best team? I don't understand. I think I think Villa. I think it's fair to say Villa have looked a, looked a little bit vulnerable. Um, yeah. To crosses into the box, whether that be through set set plays or just normal crosses into the box, we've seen that against Brentford, didn't we? You know, all three goals were were from the the right side. Um, so look, you know, it's something that they worked on in the week. It's something that they always have been working on anyway. You know, the the set piece culture at Villa is is mightily impressive. I've I've seen it in action. Um, I've spoken to people who, you know, uh, uh, players and and representatives of players who you say, say you've that, seen it in action. Do you mean you've been to the training or are you just what, talking about watching the games? 
the I, I did a big piece on um, on TrackMan, which is something that they use, yeah, um, and uh, you know I saw some of the footage through um, uh, through various contacts, um, you know, connected to the club, and and you know it was really really impressive that the level of detail that that, um, that that Villa go into, and yeah, I mean look, you know, I don't tend not to try to plug too many athletic articles on here, but if for those who haven't read um, the article that I wrote about TrackMan um, and just some of the set piece culture at, at Villa. Please go and read that on the. Maybe repost it on Twitter after this. Yeah, thing. yeah, because I mean, look, you know, set pieces are something that Villa should be celebrating. They're the best in Europe. They've scored twenty five goals through set pieces. You know, this season, the next best team is Arsenal, who have scored twenty or twenty one, I think. Um, and then Man United, uh, Man City, and Bayern Munich are, are quite close behind from there. But it's something we should really be celebrating. And and look. Um, I've said this over and over. If if Austin McPhee was shit, he wouldn't be at the club. Yeah, because Scotland, and, Scotland score a lot of goals off set pieces. Yeah, if yeah. Serves me correctly as well. Yeah, yeah, and you know, look, it, I think Villa have got very, very good people at the club now. You know, starting from Nasif Sawiris and Wes Eden, who have who have driven the club forward. You've got Unai Emery, brilliant coach who who has added that um, elite level coaching. Mark Harrison in the academy, you know, we're starting to now see players coming through that, that Villa have paid um, a little bit of money for and are also getting in, in, into the first team. You know, the player care department at, at Villa, Phil, led by Phil Roscoe, brilliant. And, you know, a set piece coach who, who has implemented a culture that, now sees Villa score more goals than anybody across Europe. I mean, you know, if, if he's not earning his money, then who is at the club? And then you've got players like Ollie Watkins, who is, you know, leading the leading the way um, across Europe for goals and assists. You know, it's it's an incredible time to 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 be a Villa supporter. I think because there's so many good people at the club and and so many people that are doing their jobs to a very very high level. Um, just hope they can see. I just hope they can get over the line now and get into Europe because I think there's a lot of people at the club that deserve it now because um, you know they've seen a lot of hard times, um, but have worked very hard to to get to where they are now. So. Yeah, gone a little bit off track. What were we talking no, no. about before? No, foot, foot, look, foot, footballing side at Villa, no complaints whatsoever. Good, good people there. I, I don't echo that thought for the, for some of the other bits, but that's just just my own uh, own opinion. But yeah, footballing side, absent, absolutely spot on in in terms of of what they've done. And Austin McPhee is one of them. As I said earlier, I'm a quite a sad man, but I still get so much enjoyment when I see Austin McPhee raise from the the dugout <laughs> when when Villa are defending or a, attacking a set set pieces. He emerges like a Game of Thrones character. <laughs> I, just, I just get enjoyment out of that. I don't, I don't know why. As I say, I'm a, I'm a sad man. You just it's horrible, spread. horrible. It's actually a horrible position to be in, isn't it, as a set piece coach? Because you can't you get the actually, defensively. You can't, you though, can't, win, you can't actually yeah. win, can you? Because that, like, the best thing that can happen from a defensive set piece is that you don't concede. That's the best thing that can happen. Yeah. And when you sort of, and when a set piece coach stands up and you're having an attacking corner or free kick. The fans are then expecting the, the, the team to score because the set-piece coaches come out. But look, I mean, I think what we're seeing across the board now is set-piece coaches taking a little bit of a back seat. The reason Austin McPhee is, you know, um, sort of out there on the touchline instructing his orders is because that's directed from Uno Emery. You know, Emery says, look, 80 sort of 85% of set-pieces is down to you. Um, you have the freedom to go and... Um, instruct whenever you like. What you'll see at sort of some of the other clubs is that set pieces tend to take a, a a bit of a back seat because it's more on the manager and the manager wants his own way. But Emery's happy to sort of delegate in that way. Yeah, well, I can't get Austin McPhee being in Game of Thrones out out of, out of my head now. He, <laughs> it sounds like a Game of Thrones character. It looks like a Game of Thrones character. He sounds like a Game of Thrones character. Just go to the just go to the House of Villa to to see Austin McPhee. It, it sounds like something from. Game of Thrones, not that I've really. Ever I've never watched it, so I, I started it, it and I got quite far into it. I got into season, mm-hmm. season two, and I, 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 could, I lost lost my way with it a little bit. Like, there's too much football. I don't have time for for anything else. When you need to watch football for work and stuff, and you know, and don't get me wrong, I'd be, I'd be watching it anyway. I find it difficult to have time to watch anything else on on, on my own. You know, I've got a few <laughs> programs that I watch with, with with Jen, but you know, really, I don't have time for. For programs on on my own anymore. You mentioned Ollie Watkins there. I think felt like it got picked up for maybe one of the first times yesterday. How ridiculous it is that he is where he is in the in just the goal scoring charts alone because everyone else takes penalties. 
Watkins has yeah. had 19 goals with no penalties. I think that's an absolutely in- incredible stat. You said as well, you know, top of the goal contributions across the Premier League. Unbe- unbelievable shows what a complete striker that he's turned into. And I really liked after the game that Emmy Martinez was saying he should be a contender for PFA Player of the Year. Mm. I think six players get nominated. I think I think I'm right. He yeah, has to just, be in the top six. He has he, to. I mean, he has to be in. He has to be in the reckoning. He, of course, he has to be in the conversation. You, you feel like Foden's going to get it the season mm. he's had. Um, but boring, though, isn't it? That, no, I no, hey, no I love, it's not I boring. Love I think Foden's a great player in the Premier League. I, I, I really enjoy watching him. And I, I want to see him more. I, in fact, every time I see him play, wow. Well, I want to watch him more and I'm really excited for what he could do for England this year. He'll be brilliant um, on that bench. Euros. Sorry, he better be playing. Nah, he'll play. He's in the, he's in the 11. <laughs> he he'll better be, play. we better find a way to play. Nah, him, he'll but, be, he'll be. Um, but yeah, and, and look, you know, Ollie Watkins, I'm sure he's going to feature heavily as well. Um, whether that, whether that be as a backup striker coming on off the bench or playing maybe one of the group games if we've if we've qualified already, uh, look, he's going to feature. He's, he's a really important part of the England team now, I think. Uh, and there's there's no better striker to turn to if Harry Kane isn't isn't performing. Yeah, just a great. Or need, well. needs a bit of help. Yeah, I know. I know it took a little nick off um, Smith, Smith Rowe yeah. yesterday, but it's still a great, great finish. Shows the the confidence of the guy, especially after Troy Deeney's comments in. In midweek, which I wasn't even, I didn't. No, I missed that. Happened until the game. He said he's a, basically, he said that he's a winger pretending to be a striker. You don't score nineteen goals in the Premier League if you're a winger pretending to be a striker. He was a, he was a centre forward that was playing as a winger. Basically, is the way I would, I would look at look at it. I think it was an unwise yeah, comment from. Uh, I, like, I, like, I like Troy. I think I've, you know, I've, in, I've had, I've interviewed him a few times. I like him. I like his honesty. Um, I've got nothing major I, I like against him. Like him as a doing blues fan. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I, I like him. I think he's quite a unique person, and there aren't many sort of characters like him in football. So I like that part about him. But I think he probably needed to have a look at Ollie Watkins' goal scoring record over the course of his career um, and realise that, he, you know, he scored regularly um, um, across his career. So, you know, he, he's a goal scorer, he's a striker, he's a centre forward. Um, and he's doing very well for England, uh, for, for Villa and hopefully England in the summer. Yeah, another player that's in the goals this season, Leon Bailey, didn't start yesterday, came on, which, you know, you probably think was part of the, the game plan. Maybe, maybe um, he said Smith Rowe then. Smith Rowe's definitely not Villa's manager. Maybe maybe Emery, <laughs> you know, that was that was part of the, the thinking. Leon Bailey is in Villa's best 11, but for this game, let's use him as, a, as an impact sub. And I actually think he took that goal, really. I don't think that was a, an easy finish on his right foot at all. You know, it came at him with some some speed. It wasn't the easiest angle in the world. It would have been easy to, to lash at that and, and, mm. and miss it, but he controlled it, kept it down and and beat the goal cape. You know, great to see him on, on the score sheet. His numbers, uh, you know, not equally as impressive as Watkins, but in terms of minutes played, his numbers are staggering. Yeah, num- numbers, numbers of numbers are frightening. Considering what we thought was going to oh, happen so to wrong. him, so so you wrong. know, and, and and like I think you could you could you could ask everybody um, in Villa Park at the you know back end middle of last season, or when Stephen Gerrard was getting sacked. You know what what do you think of Leon Bailey? And I don't think really anybody would have said. Um, a, he's going to kick on at Villa, but absolutely no chance would he would he kick on to this level. Um, so it just shows you know that there are pl- there are you know, real qualities in players that need to be brought out of them. Yes, there were some uh, reservations about Bailey and, and uh, you know, about his work rate. They People at Villa wanted him to work a lot harder. Um, but yeah, he's, he's getting his rewards at the moment for, for, for working really hard and, again, being another one that can take on instructions. You know, the, the goal was something that, that Villa have, uh, have worked on. With Emery and, and again, uh, um, you know, during set-piece practice, it, it's something that pushing... Um, Pushing Pau Torres to the front post to allow space for for some of Villa's attackers. Um, you'll see in the West Ham game, I think there was a very similar um, there was a very similar incident where Torres was right at the front post and it sort of opened up space um, for for some of the attackers. And yeah, you know Bailey was there at the right spot, uh, right spot at the right time. You know, working on those working on those patterns of play that they've that they've worked so hard on um, and coming off the bench and making an impact. I thought I, I had it in my head. I wondered if Emery was thinking, let's let's use uh, Bailey in the Lille game. Um, not 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 sort of. Um, disrespecting Arsenal and thinking that uh but you know you've got a 50 million pound player in in 
in Diaby. So, you know, there's, there's not much difference really in the two, is there? Except for Bailey keeps getting a lot of goals and Diaby doesn't. Well, you know, not many players when they look back at the end of the season highlights reel of their of their season will be able to say that they've got a match winner against <laughs> Manchester City, a match winner, match winning goal against Arsenal, and a match winning assist against Arsenal in the yeah. in the home game as well. You know, in the big games, like Ollie Watkins, Leon Bailey has been a massive part. You know, even the fact that Villa have done the double over Arsenal, this is the best Arsenal team in a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And Villa have done the double over them without conceding a goal. I mean, that just if, if you need to know anything about Unai Emery, yeah. that's probably the one thing that you might put. Actually, it wouldn't be the thing I'd pull out, actually, but it's a great thing to pull out. It's not bad for a winger trying to be a striker, is it? To be fair, and... no, it's pretty, pretty. What would it, actually? That's an interesting question. If you had to pull out, if you, if you were given, you know, someone's rang you up and they want to do a piece on Unai Emery, and they ask you what if you could pick one thing that you think is the biggest thing about Unai Emery since he's been at Aston Villa, what would that one thing be? I think I know what mine is. If only allowed one. Con- consistently improving the amount, uh, in- improving a large percentage of that the squad making yeah. them better players well you done me over because that's what I was going to say as well mm. the, pl- the amount of players that have improved under his tutelage yeah. I've again I, I always say I, I don't think this is biased what I'm about about to say because I think I'm quite realistic and I'm, and I'm quite honest I don't remember another manager that's come into a football club in the Premier League era and improved so many players that were already there made them better I don't remember that happening anywhere else. I'm trying to think of like Klopp when he came into Liverpool or or Pep. It took when some they came time, didn't it, for both of them? You remember Pep, you know, Man City finished third in Pep's first quick, season. hasn't they? He improved those players. Straight up. Villa beat Manchester yeah. United. They hadn't beat since 1995 at Villa Park. His first game, and he had a matter of days with the players. But the improvement in nearly... I, I can't even think of a player that's... There's certainly no one that I think, oh, he's gone backwards under, under Emre. So maybe a few that haven't performed this season like they did last season when they have played, like Ramsey or Moreno. But I think that's probably down to down to injury and, and, and lack of pre-season. You can't really think of anyone who isn't better than they were when he walked through the door. It was already there. <laughs> no. The, no the, the, look, across the board, v- Villa's players are better under Uno Emery and his team. Something we, we do have to highlight, it is his team you know, as well. Yes, certainly. But he, has, we, he we, takes the credit as the other. Yes, he takes the credit as the man who oversees everything. But you've, what you've got to remember is, you know, Uno Emery could not do this himself. First of all, he couldn't do it himself without his coaching team and his support team and his, and his analysis team. Then he probably couldn't do it with all the resource it without all the resources that Villa have at the club. And then he also definitely couldn't do it without the support of Nassif Sawiris and Wes Eden. So let's remember that yes, Unai Emery is a brilliant manager and he's taken Villa forward and he's he but he's all he's it's not all he's done because it is so much, but he's added that elite level around the coaching that they didn't have already. Now his support team are um, you know, mightily important as well. You know, you look at Rodri, the the individual coach. There aren't many clubs that have an individual coach. Villa, uh, Villa haven't ever had one. Trailblazers, um, Villa. Yeah. You know, so so these are players. Uh, these are people that Unai Emery trusts in. You know, people that he's known for a very very long time, um, and he can delegate certain oh. tasks to. Um, you know, and I've spent time at football clubs. You know, across the board. You know, in the Premier League, in Scotland, in League One, in League Two, in the Championship, and you see the difference when you have a very big support network. It's easier. I've watched. I, I spent time with Sean Maloney, for example, up, up at Hibernian, who are a you know an SBL team, and he had. I think he had five staff members and like he was doing so much throughout the day. You know, he was getting there. He was first through the door. He was the last out. He was getting there, um, setting up all the meetings, taking training, then doing individual um, uh, meetings, individual sessions. And and he'd, he'd occasionally allow his assistant manager to go and take a certain group of players. But at Villa, they've got so much, so many staff that they can delegate all these little tasks to um, to other people. And allow the manager to focus on the really important things. That's not to say that Unai Emery doesn't work hard and work on Gowers because he does. Yes, they've died down a little bit now. They're not as intense as they were at the start. But 
there are so many people that he can turn to for help. Um, and that just allows him to focus on the real key points. And the real key points are where, you know, he earns his money. So many tactical masterclasses over over the course of his time so far. I would kill to be able to spend a week at Bodymore. <laughs> now, just, yeah. Just fun. watch mm. what goes on. See mm. the intricacy. See the level of detail that they all go into. All the different things that they must work on that I don't know about. I would absolutely kill to be able to just to just do that. If I'd won the Euro millions and won like, I don't know, stupid with the 60 million pounds, I would pay a million pounds to just go and spend the week. It would help with PSR as well, you know, so I'd be doing my bit to, to, to help the club. I would love to just go and go and watch. It must be absolutely fascinating. Even the players, although they're, you know, they're working hard, they're probably putting more hours in than they've ever put in in terms of what they're watching and what they're doing. They must walk out of it and think, this is amazing. How lucky are we to be able to, to do this every, every day? It's, I don't know, you know, I no. think that there, there are, <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty intense, you know, there's so many meetings and they go on for so long. And look, if I, I've said this consistently since when, uh, since Emery took, took over, if, if Villa were not getting results, you know, players would turn on that manager very, very quickly because there's so much asked of them. Um, but, the the buy in is there because the results follow, and they all know they're better they're better players because of it. Um, you know, a lot a lot of, a lot of praise has to go to themselves as well yeah, for, ex- for executing it. You know, you, you, Emery couldn't do this with a bunch of numpties. They they are very they they're expensive, hot, you know, talented players who who are there on merit as well, um, and have just needed that elite level coaching to bring it out of them. Another thing, like I'm rubbish at football, but I'd love to just have for spend a for spend a year with Unai Emery. Do you think I would get better? Even no. I'm not great. I wouldn't. He wouldn't be able to. He no. wouldn't be able to do that. What about no. you? You, I think you're quite you're reasonably hander. No you shit. To, no. Oh, you crap as well. <laughs> I'm terrible. You know, I always think you're either good at talking about football or you're good at playing it. And, you know, people <laughs> probably have I'm their neither. opinions. <laughs> yeah, people probably have their opinions on whether we're good at talking about football. But, you know, I definitely think I'm stronger at talking about football than than I am at, at, at playing. I did have something else. So oh, I've got one more question for you before we go. Obviously, you're you're covering Liverpool at the moment. I don't know whether you were, whether you were there. Yes, I know. I know you will have, will have watched the game for, for absolute certain. It, it really a crazy day. In the in the Premier League yesterday, I don't think Villa were ten to one yeah. before the games. If you'd done a yeah. double on Villa, in fact, if you'd done a treble on Fulham to win to, to win as well yesterday, I think the odds you would have got would have been yeah. up three, three away is very 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 yeah. unusual anyway. You know, regardless games. of the teams, three yeah. away. Yeah, the odds would have been. Br- yeah. I said this on Talksport last week mm-hmm. that you know Liverpool are looking for a new manager at the moment. Amory appears to be the favourite at the moment. I don't want this to happen. I'm not trying to manifest it into the universe. I know what happened with Emery at Arsenal as well, but I kind of feel like Liverpool are a different type of club. I'm amazed he doesn't get talked about. I think it's so disrespectful. I don't want him to go. I don't think he would go. But do you think... I don't want to hear De Zerbe mentioned and Amory. I think, how is he not in the conversation? Am I just... You know, have I got Villa Blinkers on? He's brilliant. Think- He's so, so good. Why does he not even get... A brief mm. mention. If you mm. looked at the odds, you probably wouldn't even be in there. I think I've kind of touched on it and covered it already. It's the fact that he has got such a big support team. The fact that Villa have given him everything, oh right? Yeah. You know, Unai Emery is the most important person at Villa behind the owners. I've I've, tr- I've said that from the very, very start. I said that when I Mont- think he might be more important than the owners in terms <laughs> You know, he's got the most power, what I'm trying to say. He's got the most power. Um, I tried to put this across when Monchi was was hired. Um, Un- Mon- Unai, Mon- Unai Emery is Monchi's boss, effectively. You know, it's it's not a case of... he He's the most important person, at, at, you know, apart from the owners at the football club. So a club like Liverpool, for example, would not be interested in taking his entire support team. And... Mm-hmm. Any interested club knows that the risk they take of potentially hiring Emery without all of his support team and without everything that he needs and without all of his demands, it could end up like an Arsenal, you know, where okay. it didn't where it didn't quite go. So it, so he's not actually that appealing to clubs because of that reason. Now, you to get Unai Emery into your club, you have to bring everyone with you, and. Ooh. 
a club. Okay, Gerard bought about seven thousand lit- people with him when 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 he. But Villa are a club that are prepared to do that. Liverpool aren't. Okay, okay. I mean, Liverpool, Liverpool have a setup that's that's pre- that, you know that yeah. they that they like already. You know, with Michael Edwards um, returning back to the club, they've already hired a sporting director yes. in, in Richard Hughes. So you know they need somebody or want somebody who will come in and work almost on their terms as well. You know. Emery you know, wants to be the most important person at a football club. He's got that at Villa now. It's unlikely okay. he would get that at many other clubs. That makes but, sense. I, mean, I don't want it to happen, as I said, obviously. It won't happen. He won't go to Liverpool. But, um, you know, I, I get your point that there should be, everybody in football should be recognising the incredible job that he's doing. And you'd be thinking, you know, there aren't many clubs in world football that wouldn't want a manager like this managing their club because he's, you know, what he's doing. I think credit to Villa then for allow, allowing that to happen. That's a you know good good decision, man. They did they to be fair they did. It was the risky, same. wasn't it? It was they risky. did the same with Gerard, and it didn't work. It was risky. Yeah, of course it was risky. Giving him everything, you know, if it didn't go to plan, there was you know serious serious issues. If 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 Emery didn't work for Villa, because bringing everybody in and getting letting everybody go it would have been very expensive. And then where'd you turn? You know, because you've recruited everybody in. Yes, they they made a little bit of a mistake with Gerard. I still, I still look back at it, the Gerrard appointment, and I think somebody in the Premier League, what a club in the Premier League, were going to take a chance on him because of his playing career, because of what he'd done at Rangers. He was worth a go at the time. It's just a shame that Villa found out that he, you know, he weren't for them. But there was going to be a club in the Premier League that were going to try him at some point. Well, we've ended up in the right place off the back of it, so I'm not, I don't, I'm not as anti that appointment. Now. Yeah, no, and look, and and, and look, in a great place because did. of that. Yeah, and look, you know, Villa went through a, a relatively thorough um, um, recruitment, you know, search for him. They interviewed Frank Lampard, they interviewed Thomas Frank, they interviewed others, um, you know, so there, there were, the, it was an extensive search and, and Gerard came out on top of that search, so. Clubs make mistakes at the end of the day, don't they? But they tell you Yeah, what they and they've definitely... rectified it now. So that's mate, they could not have rectified that with any better. Probably one of the best is rectification a word? One of the best <laughs> rectifications that, that, that there's ever been. You know, you, you said about, you know, other teams wouldn't look at Unai Emery. You know, he is I'm trying to think where one of the, I mean, I know that some staff and, and players and people around the players listen to the the podcast. I don't think Unai Emery does, but Unai Emery, if you are if you are listening, you are Changed my life. Arguably more important to me than most family members. So, yeah. <laughs> Hope your family don't listen. <laughs> my dad. My, my dad does. I didn't say. I didn't say which. Uh, which, which family members? But yeah. Uh, what a manager. And days like yesterday, you sometimes you have to. I think you have to pinch yourself and think how like, how good is this manager? How lucky are we to, to to have him at the club? So yeah, a brilliant day. I don't think I'll be able to wipe the smile off my face. Maybe until Thursday, we'll see, we'll see what happens on <laughs> on Thursday. But yeah, there'll be a be a preview for the for, for the little guys. So we won't talk about that now. We've done a done a longer session than we normally do there, Greg. Hopefully, yeah. people have uh, appreciated that and not turned off after about forty minutes, and they've enjoyed the the longer look into Arsenal nil, Aston Villa two, as Villa do the double over Arsenal in the title race. Right then, do all the things that help the channel, please. If you could like, subscribe, wherever you're taking in the podcast, comment as uh, as well. Yeah, let's look to get... Because Villa, Villa have won. I, we never hit the likes targets, I said, really. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set a 700 like target. I know that there'll be more than 700 people that watch this video on, on YouTube. So yeah, give this video a like, please. Let's try and hit 700 likes. And if you're not subscribed to the channel on YouTube, if you could please, please do that. Let's get those numbers up. I felt like we hit like 24,000 in the championship. And we just kept to the same people. No one knew who's ever, ever, ever come along. It was <laughs> the same people that were watching in those dark days, interviewing fans outside the ground in uh, Villa 1, Barnsley 3. And you know, it's the same people are just are just watching, which I obviously appreciate. But let's get some let's get some new blood in as well. Greg, thanks ever so much for joining me this morning in the early hours to, to talk to me. Very much appreciated. And thanks to Adam, who'll have to go on and have the pain of editing this show. Thank you to NordVPN as well for continuing to sponsor us. And a cheeky little plug for Luke Roper as well. You'll get 20% off everything Luke have to offer, including Chris Wokes' new range if you use the code TVV20. So if you want to get yourself some new clubber and sell Celebrate Villa's victory. If you use our code TVV20, we get a tiny little kickback from that as well. So that would really help. 
the channel as well because Adam spends too much money on various pieces of software that only work 50% of the time. So, yeah, we need the money to, to cover Adam's extortion costs. Thank you ever so much. As I say, preview for Lil in the week. But if you subscribe, you'll know exactly when the new videos are coming out. Have a brilliant week. 